Our first speaker today is uh, Matt Stimson, and uh, he is going to tell us about um, non-marine trace fossils. So we're moving back, we're back in the terrestrial world again, and we're going to be looking at animals and the traces they leave us. Matt, you are up. Thanks very much, Bill. Uh, good morning, everybody, or afternoon. Uh, first, of all, I'd like to thank my two co-authors, Olivia King, who's here with me, and Spencer Lucas. Uh, this talk is divided in two. Uh, I'll be talking about continental ecology, but I'll be talking about basically conventional continental ecology, or what I call conventional uh, trackways and trails and burrows. I'm going to be emitting things like uh, copper lights and some of those other more obscure things. And we're going to be hearing more about uh, <coughs> interactions uh, a little bit later today. My talk is divided in two. I'll be talking about invertebrates first and then vertebrates. The invertebrate work is mostly a reprisal of Betois and Magano's work. It's not my own. And then uh, the vertebrate material is a paper that Olivia and Spencer and others and I published just a couple of days ago. Next slide, please. Next slide. Okay. Uh, so here's a few comments from Betois and Magano in 2000, uh, 2018. And, and I agree with these mostly. Trace fossils represent an additional line of evidence to evaluate changes in diversity. This is mostly true. Uh, they suggest variable rates of increase in ichnodiversity with major radiations. I'll show you a couple of those in a second. And they do show a slower increase, uh, uh, increases to plateaus between periods of dramatic increase. Next slide. I'll come back to those in a minute. When we talk about paleontology, we look at biodiversity, which is a number of species. But in trace fossil world, we uh, talk about ichnodiversity. We stick ichno in front of everything because we study a parataxonomy. We don't follow the biological taxonomy, but a parallel to that. So we're talking about the number of ichno species and ichno genera, uh, which really focuses on different behaviors involved in animal substrate interactions rather than the actual animal itself. So what is the animal doing and what is its expression in a sedimentary realm? Uh, this is really tough to do in continental environments for a number of reasons. Uh, but including that, uh, you know, we have a patchiness and trace fossil record uh, just because of taphonomic reasons. Next slide. please. So a few key concepts. Uh, ichnodiversity is the number of ichnotaxa, the different ichnogenera and ichnospecies. And the graphs I'm going to show you in a minute are at the ichnogeneric level, not the ichnospecific level, uh, focusing on the different genera. And this is different from ichnodisparity, which measures a... Uh, the variability of morphological body plants. So how different do things look? So an example might be a millipede or a centipede versus a lobster today. They're very different, which represent different uh, high taxonomic levels. So family or perhaps even orders as opposed to different species. So measuring ichnodisparity at a more fine resolution is, is a challenging thing to do. Next slide. So here's an example where we have a horseshoe crab. These are a living fossil today, which are making two different types of traces. Selenichnites, where the animal stopped and burrowed in the sediment a little bit, leaving a body impression. We give that one ichnogenus called Selenichnites, where it's walking trail called cuphicnium. Uh, and we name these based on morphology and behavior. The walking behavior is called cuphicnium. The resting trace or the, the digging burrowing trace is called Selenichnites. But they're both made by the same animal. So we have two different ichno species, that's ichno diversity, uh, but also two different behaviors. Uh, and they morphologically look very different. So that would be an increase in ichno disparity. Uh, next slide. But they're both made by the same animal. If we look at different invertebrates, uh, even within a single time period, many animals leave different traces, but many of these animals can leave different types of traces depending on what they're doing. Some of them look very similar, and they would be classified into the same ichno genus. So this would be some examples of ichno disparity versus something very different like a burrow, diplocriterion on the right-hand side. Next slide. So in the continental realm, where do we see trace fossils? We, through time, there are a number of what we call ichno facies models uh, or different realms in which we find trace fossils. But in the Carboniferous period, we only really see them in two. The Scoenia, or terrestrial fluvial alluvial systems, and the Myrmia ichnofacies, or lacustrine environments. Next slide. Uh, 
But in the, the Mississippian and Pennsylvanian, uh, we see invertebrates and vertebrates invading land, uh, continental environment, <clears throat> only in the, the Mermia transitional zone into the Scoenia, and eventually we see the Mermia later in, in younger rocks. So the Tornasian period, uh, even though invertebrates invaded land sometime in the Silurian or the Devonian, uh, we see invertebrates and vertebrates both invading land, continental realms, during the Mississippian period. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> if we look at Batois and Magano's work in 2018, uh, they look at ichnodiversity and ichnodisparity through time. This is the entire uh, uh, geological time scale. You can see a number of pulses in ichnodiversity, uh, both in Silurian and the earliest Permian, Jurassic, and so on, uh, with long periods of gradual or plateaued growth. Next slide. If we zoom in on the Carboniferous and Permian, what you see at an ichnogeneric level is a gradual increase in ichnodiversity, but we don't really see uh, a spike in the Casimovian, and there's a number of reasons why that might be. Next slide. Uh, <clears throat> so yeah, we see this steady increase in continental diversity, and part of this might be due to the specialization of insects eating woody plant materials, which we'll hear about in, in subsequent talk. Next slide. If we look at ichnodisparity, that's the change in morphology of traces. Uh, again, in the Chasmovian, you can see a plateau followed by a gradual increase in the Permian, but we don't really see a spike, and this really parallels some of the talks that we saw yesterday in the body fossil record of invertebrates. Next slide. So why this lack of ichnodiversity, or at least a resolution uh, in the Chasmovian or uh, you know, at an ichnogeneric level? Next slide. <clears throat> well, if we take one ichnogenus, diplocnides, which are classically thought to be made mill millipedes or myriapods, including the giant colossal Arthropleura, uh, a two meter long centipede from the Carboniferous period, you can see in the top left corner. If we look at all of the ichno species that are known, these are all the types or as many of them as I could find. Uh, they look very similar in some ways, but if you start looking at the finer details, they are morphologically very different. These traces are probably made by a, a number of different critters. So if you start looking at biodiversity versus ichno diversity, the ichno diversity is very low for this genus, uh, where it's all one genera. But at the specific level, ichno specific level, they're probably being made by a number of animals. Uh, next slide. One problem that we can throw into the mix is uh, a concept called undertrack. If an animal is, its footprints are being represented at different levels in the sediment, as you start peeling those layers away, they can look very differently. So this horseshoe crab track has Y-shaped impressions on the left, but on the far right, a deep uh, expression of its trackways may look like a millipede trackway. Next slide, causing some confusion. If we start looking at other ichnogenera, which look very similar, these are many different ichnogenera, which look very similar and probably are junior synonyms of diplocnides, or they might be, uh, showing that we really have to dive into some of the details and resolve some of these ichnotaxonomic issues. If you start comparing to ichnodiversity, Ichno disparity and start thinking about the, the biodiversity at the time, uh, there's a lot of taxonomic issues here which are going to cause some issues and lower the resolution of what we can really tell about what's going on during the Chasmovian or any time period. Next slide. So this is just a quick summary of this. So we may have uh, one ichno genus with multiple species representing a high biodiversity, but in the ichno diversity world, it only shows up as one ichno genus and very low ichno diversity versus perhaps a lot of these junior synonyms which at the generic level, let alone the species level, which might actually be diplocnides or, or can be lumped together uh, as junior synonyms, which show a high ichno diversity, but are actually very low ichno diversity because of taxonomic problems. Next slide. So we have an ichno taxonomic bias uh, the invertebrate ichnotaxa represent behavior rather than actual biodiversity. So invertebrates, in my opinion, uh, at least in their traces, do not act as a proxy for biodiversity, not directly at least. Next slide. 
When we move over to the vertebrate ichnotaxonomy, I think the resolution is much better. Traditionally, trackways of vertebrates are considered uh, based on their morphology. If it looks different, it gets a different name, but they did not account for substrate and extramorphological variation. So all of the trackways in the bottom left are made by the same animal, but you can see they're slipping and sliding around, leaving different shapes. Traditionally, these would all get different names. So, but we're really looking at, uh, at the morphology of the actual footprint, not the behavior. All of these animals are walking, it's locomotion. But as a result, traditionally, it's resulted in oversplitting of ichnotaxonomy in the vertebrate traces. Now, in my opinion, a lot of good workers like uh, Spencer Lucas, Marchetti, Voigt, and others have done a lot of really good work to clean up the ichnotaxonomy. I think we have a much better idea of the ichnotaxonomic diversity through time uh, because of the last 10, 20 years. This talk is going to exclude things like swim traces or burrows. We're only gonna look at the footprints. Next slide, please. When we look at vertebrate ichnotaxonomy, we're now looking at what we call anatomy consistent morphology. Can we match the footprint to the foot? And in a lot of cases we can, this is pulled out of our paper with Lorenzo Marchetti, uh, recently published looking at reptile footprints, the trackway known Lacerta, comparing it to the skeletal remains of early anapsid uh, uh, reptiles, Paleothyrus and Hylonymus. And you can start to make the, make the connection between the foot to the trace. Next slide. Which gives us a better idea of, of who was walking around. There are some problems where trackways are homeomorphic, so you can end up with a lot of different species or genera that belong to the same group, uh, different reptiles that leave the same type of footprint, or different groups of, of tetrapods that leave the same type of footprint based on similar shaped feet. Uh, so as a result, you know, multiple or one ichnotax can be left by many different animals. And this is basically because the footprint morphology, despite the changes in biology, the footprint morphology doesn't change very quickly through time. And this can cause a few issues. Next slide. <clears throat> so when we look at ichnodiversity and ichnodisparity in fossil or tetrapod fossil record, all of these uh, animals are really leaving only one body morphology. They've got four legs, one tail, one head, and a backbone, but their footprints can leave a high ichnodiversity, different morphologies and shapes of the feet, which can tell us at least in the broadest sense, what type of animals are walking around. But as a result, we have a delay in the turnover of ichnogenera through time, which we can then use as biochrons, very long-standing biochrons, which I'm gonna talk about. Next slide. If we look at where Carboniferous tetrapod localities, trackway localities are around the world, they seem to be mostly focused around the Paleo Equator. There's a couple of outliers down in, in South America. Next slide. I'm working mostly in Atlantic Canada, so I'm gonna refer back to this a few times uh, and, and show you how the Maritimes Basin, which is considered the gold standard for late Paleozoic continental ichnotaxonomy, uh, next slide, compares to the rest of the fossil record. In Atlantic Canada, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, we have an almost continuous record of late Paleozoic strata extending from the latest Devonian through to the earliest Permian with only a few major gaps in the tetrapod record, uh, the first one being in the Visayan and the Mississippian period due to a continental uh, in, insertion from uh, the sea, uh, what's known as the Windsor Sea, the only truly not or truly marine uh, incursion in the Maritimes Basin. In the Serpicovian, uh, late Serp Serpicovian associated with the Mississippian Pennsylvanian uh, boundary, and annoyingly, the Chasmovian Gap, so we have trackways in the Muscovian and the Gazellian and up into the, the Permian period, but we have very few strata in Atlantic Canada or at least recognized with, with Chasmovian aged rocks. Next slide. Geological time has been subdivided in the past dating back to the 1800s, uh, going back to the Eosaurus and Sorpus beds um, based on the morphology of footprints that we see through time. Next slide. Uh, and we're doing the same uh, in a paper published two days ago with Spencer as lead author. And I'm going to go through some of these. The, the oldest and the first uh, major advance that we see in tetrapod technology is the oldest continental tetrapod assemblages at places like Blue Beach in Nova Scotia uh, from the early Mississippian and the Tornasian. And this has been named the Hylopus Biochron. It extends for all of the Mississippian into the, the earliest Pennsylvanian. Next slide. Very few localities worldwide, but at Horton Bluff, uh, 
There's been over 7,000 trackways uh, collected since the mid 1800s, mostly by the Blue Beach Fossil Center. Next slide. <clears throat> and all of these tracks represent a very low diversity of animals, including Paleosauropus, Batrachychnus, and, and Pseudobratopus. Batrachychnus and Paleosauropus are a great example of where the trackway record can tell us something about the oldest occurrence <clears throat> uh, or the lowest occurrence of an animal, even if we don't have the skeletons. There are no skeletons of early temnospondyls this far back in the fossil record, but their footprints of Batrachychnus and Paleosauropus betray their presence. We'll talk about a few different examples of like this today. Next slide. By the late Mississippian, we see in the mock chunk formation of Pennsylvania, the exact same uh, ichnogenera, uh, Hylopus, Pseudobratopus, Bactrachychnus, Paleosauropus, found at, uh, in Pennsylvania in late Mississippian rocks, but in red beds, fluvial, alluvial sediments where animals have obviously now invaded more dry continental squeenia type environments. Next slide. We see the same patterns in New Brunswick uh, in similar age rocks, uh, what's known as the Munson Pond Marigland Formation. And again, no surprise, the same characters walking around, Paleosauropus, Hylopus, Batrachychnus. Next slide. So very little change in any of the ichnodiversity through the whole of the Mississippian. But by the time that we hit the Pennsylvanian, we see the next major change in ichnodiversity. <clears throat> in the, the earliest Pennsylvanian, in the Bashkirian, we see most of these animals represented by the orange bars, uh, these early amphibious and amphibian uh, reptile transitional animals known as reptiliomorphs, still crossing the Mississippi and Pennsylvanian boundary. But we have a, new, a few new additions, including the earliest known amniotes or the captorhinomorphs, uh, highlighted here in orange. Next slide. So we see a, a huge boom in the tetrapod diversity based on trackways. The ones, the track <coughs> names here, which are, are backed in a, a black square, are some of the ones that transist through the Mississippi into Pennsylvania. But now we have a lot of new ichnogenera crossing that boundary. One I'm going to focus on is Nodalacerta and Dromopus today. Next slide. So Nodalacerta pops up at, at a few localities. Uh, the oldest are at the in the Potsdam Formation of the Union Chapel Mines locality and at Joggins, Nova Scotia, here in Atlantic Canada, as well as up in the Kyoto, Oklahoma. Next slide. And this is the onset of the nodal, nodal sort of biochrome. So the best example, <clears throat> or one of the, the earliest examples, are at Joggins, Nova Scotia, where we have nodal asserta, this early reptile track associated with the oldest known amniote skeletons, Hylonymus lyali, found within the, the uh, like copsid trees, <clears throat> excuse me, at Joggins. Next slide. Uh, an amazing assemblage of, of tracks, low diversity, but high abundance at Union Chapel Mines. <clears throat> also shows nodal asserta, as well as Cinchosaurus, which may be the same type of trackway, all attributed to reptiles uh, in great abundance. Next slide. And some of the best examples uh, are found at Kyoto, Oklahoma. Again, very low diversity, but high abundance of, of amphibian and reptile tracks, again, with some of the best examples of nodal assertive found so far. Next slide, <clears throat> from the middle Pennsylvania. In the early Pennsylvania, we also have the oldest occurrence of pelic pelicosaurs from bones in the Gajelian, but in the early uh, Pennsylvania, in the Beshkirian, we have the oldest evidence of their footprints. Next slide. These trackways known as Demetropus, which are thought to be made by animals similar to to uh, uh, Demetrodon, although these are not Demetrodons, these are Eupelicosaurs, earlier ancestors. Next slide. As well as the oldest evidence of diadecomorphs. Next slide. Diadecomorph trackways, known as Ichnotherium, are found in the Muscovian and, and Kesemovian. Uh, this is the oldest example from Alvi uh, uh, UK, although younger examples of diadecomorph skeletons and this trackway have been found in Europe. So this trackway found in the UK in the Muscovian is uh, considered the oldest evidence of diadecomorphs inferred from the trackways. Next slide, which pushes the age of diadecomorphs and consequently the uh, origin of high fiber herbivory back into the, uh, into the Pennsylvania, earlier Pennsylvania. Next slide. If we look at the Gazellian, we see the lowest occurrence of Dromopus. Notice I, I jumped over the Chasmovian. There's a reason. 
the oldest evidence of the trackway, uh, Dromopus. Next slide. These are, footprints are slightly different than nodal lacerta. Nodal lacerta is assigned to early anapsids, uh, such as Hylonymus or Paleothyrus, the oldest known reptiles in the early Pennsylvanian. But dromopus are assigned to parareptiles and eureptiles, which are diapsids. They're a more advanced type of reptile. Now, I'm not going to go through all the, the boring ichno taxonomy on these, but just look at the two, two tracks, and you can see that they are morphologically different. Uh, slight differences between the two, but they do have a little bit different shape. Next slide. The oldest example, the oldest confirmed definite example of Dromopus is from the Howard Limestones in Kansas, which is at the Kazimovian Gazalian boundary. And this marks what we're calling the Dromopus biochrons. So we're moving out of the nodal Lacerta biochron into the Dromopus biochron. So we're starting to subdivide the Pennsylvanian based on the trackway assemblages. Next slide. However, there are two occurrences in Morocco and England uh, in the Casimovian, which might actually represent the oldest Dromopus example. Uh, if you look at the, the green scale on the right-hand side of where Nodal Lacerda is found, it seems to end at the Casimovian boundary, Casimovian gazellian boundary. Uh, then it disappears and comes back later in the Permian. Uh, we're not really sure why that is. I'm not going to get into it, but if the oldest occurrence of Dromopus is pushed back a little bit, we might have a Dromopus nodal Lacerta interval or an interval biochron in between. But the ages of both of these localities is still a little bit in question. Next slide. <clears throat> if we look at Atlantic Canada and the Maritimes Basin, uh, the trackway record mirrors this. The oldest example of Dromopus is found in the, the early Gajalian at rural Nova Scotia with some beautiful examples uh, from that locality. Next slide. And we also see a change in environment at that time from the uh, lycopsid dominated, wetland dominated uh, ecosystems in the lower Pennsylvanian. And it's changed and, and uh, replaced by the Walkie and Conifer drylands that we see continuing into the Permian, much like everywhere else uh, in the fossil record. This is a, a really diverse ichno fossil assemblage at that locality. Um, next slide. So if, if we look at the whole of the Maritimes Basin, uh, we can see that we have nodal Lacerta at Joggins uh, in the, the earlier Beshkirian and the early Pennsylvanian. We have a, a Dromopus nodal Lacerta hybrid, something that's sort of in between. Spencer and I were talking about a couple days ago, found in the early Muscovian in what's known as the Minto Formation uh, in the late Beshkirian, early Muscovian. And we have the, the Dromopus, again, no surprise, showing up in the Gazellian. But we do not have any trackways known from the Casimovian as yet. And that may be represented by the, uh, the reason being we may simply not have any Casimovian represented here, but we need to do a lot more stratigraphy, stratigraphy work to figure that out for sure. Next slide. So a little bit of a summary here, we can look at the Hylopus biochron, subdivide time into three, the Hylopus that goes from the early Mississippian to the absolute earliest Pennsylvanian, the earliest evidence of amniotes associated with their trackways at Joggins, uh, footprints at Union Chapel Mine, Alabama, uh, of nodal Lacerta, and, and these oldest am, uh, anapsid amniotes, uh, kicks off the nodal Lacerta biochron, and it continues basically up to the end of the Casimovian, where we see the oldest Dromopus. Now, if we do uh, find that the, the Morocco and, and UK localities are indeed Casimovian in age and Muscovian in age, then perhaps that Dromopus biochron boundary has to be dropped back a little bit. But notice that these are large swaths of time, that you know we have a very slow turnover in the vertebrate chronology uh, in, their, in terms of the morphology. And this is pretty much to be expected based on what we talked about earlier in this talk. Next slide. So just a few conclusions uh, for the invertebrate ichnology. According to Batois and Megano, trends show no major change in the ichnodiversity and ichnodisparity across the Casimovian boundary in either Mermia, so lakes, or Scoenia, fluvial alluvial ichnofacies. But, you know, as we pointed out, Possibly this is a bias in the prevailing ichnotaxonomic issues at the ichnogenous and ichnospecific levels. Further ichnotaxonomic work might unveil some new details. Once we get into some of those details of 
uh, you know, some sort of a consensus on the ichno genera and ichno species through time, uh, we might get better resolution and see some changes, maybe, maybe not. And, you know, right now, uh, I would say invertebrate ichno fossils are not good proxies for biodiversity, but they are good proxies for behavioral diversity uh, through time, at least at this point in time until we've resolved some of these ichno taxonomic issues. Next slide. In the vertebrate world, uh, tetrapod tracks can be used as proxies for biodiversity uh, based on, on the uh, morphology specific uh, details that we looked at, but tetrapod footprints are homeomorphic, which means many animals can leave these similar traces through time. So we have a, a very slow turnover in the tetrapod or compared to the tetrapod skeletal record, but trackways are more common. Uh, through time. So we see footprints more often. Skeletons tend to be rare and incomplete, but Spencer will talk more about that later. The trackway record through the Pennsylvanian shows us the, that the oldest extensive continental records are found in the early Mississippi and in Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, uh, with early diversification of tetrapods to fully terrestrial tetrapod realm or continental realms. The oldest amniote footprints are found in the early Pennsylvanian of Nova Scotia, associated with skeletons. The oldest diadecomorphs and eupelicosaur footprints, so represented from footprints, not bones, is pushed back to the early Pennsylvanian, which again indicates the uh, an older origin for high fiber herbivory than the body fossil shows. Next slide. The Carboniferous tetrapod ichnology uh, can be subdivided into Hylopus, Nodalacerta, and Dromopus biochrons with Nodalacerta biochron being marked by the first appearance datum of Nodalacerta at Joggins, and the Dromopus biochron being marked by the lowest confirmed occurrence at the Howard Limestone in Kansas at the Kazimovian Gazellian boundary, but this may become older. Uh, you know, if, if we can confirm some of those Muscovian localities uh, in the UK and Morocco. Footprint assemblages do change across the uh, mid to late Pennsylvanian boundary uh, as the Kazimovian revolution, but the timing of that change is not precise. We do, simply do not have the stratigraphic density to understand the timing and structure of change in ichna diversity within the Kazimovian interval at this, at this stage in the game. Kazimovian tetrapod tracks are elusive even in the Maritimes Basin of Atlantic Canada. So even where we have what Spencer has previously called the gold standard for late Paleozoic tetrapod technology, we simply don't see Kazimovian tetrapod tracks for whatever reason that may be. Next slide. Thank you all for your attention. And uh, my co-authors and I will entertain any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Matt. Excellent and informative talk. Um, at present, I don't have any questions in the chat. Um, someone would like to send some, I'll, I'll look forward to them. Um, I, uh, I certainly have uh, some, some questions, of course. It's, uh, I'm, I'm intrigued by the idea of the, um, the early Pennsylvanian uh, pelicosaur tracks and the origin of high fiber herbivory. It's, it's really, a, you know, it's hard to tell uh, what, there's a lot of insect herbivory work, but there's not a lot of work on what vertebrates uh, might be the eating, you have all those seeds with like these armored interiors and all that kind of thing. Um, any any idea what might be going on? Got you, York. Well, that, that that's not my direct work. I mean, that's Spencer. Maybe he's got something else to say on it. But essentially, trackways are a proxy for the critters. So um, what we can say is ostensibly that ichnotherium, that morphology and footprint, is found directly with um, with the animals you know, in later Pennsylvanian rocks, early Permian rocks in, in Europe. The fact that we find the trackway in, in older rocks is, is uh, inferring that those animals might be around earlier. So, you know, until we see the skeletons, I would, I would presume Spencer may have different opinions on this or, or might be able to elaborate. But until we find the skeletons and have a look at what their, their teeth and jaws are like, you know, we don't know for sure. It's still an inference. But the fact that their footprints are around, at least the their ancestors are walking around. Spencer, do you have any, any other comment on that? Yeah, um, I'll talk about this in my talk, but you know, Sebastian Voigt described these Bashkirian footprints of Ichneotherium, which is some sort of a diadectomorph track uh, 
and of, <clears throat> and of uh, Dimetropus, which is a pelicosaur. And I've talked to him about it, and here's the problem. Those tracks could also have been made by animals that were not herbivorous. You know, Ichneotherium could have been made by a limnosolid, a more predatory um, diadectomorph. And we, we always have thought that Dimetropus was made by a variety of pelicosaurs. So the oldest bones, the oldest high fiber herbivores do appear in the Casimovian as bones. And I'll talk about that. And then we have this kind of wild card, this problem that we have these older tracks. They might be tracks of high fiber herbivores, but they're not definitively tracks. And honestly, if I had to bet on it, it why would high fiber herbivory appear in the Bashkirian? It makes more sense to me. I like it appearing in the Casimovian when the vegetation changes, you know, because normally, you know, when we think about vertebrate feeding, we always think of it as a response to a change in food. And there is not, I mean, maybe there is a change in the Bashkiria. There's changes all the time, but there's a bigger change, I think, in the vegetation in the Casimovian than there was in the Bashkirian. So that's the perspective I would put on it. Okay, thanks. Jörg Schneider and then uh, Ryan Martino. So Jörg, if you can turn on your camera and you. Thanks, Matt, for your talk. Uh, do you see any link in the frequency of the very common uh, apoplerid trails in the West Coast, you know, uh, or New Brunswick, and in relation to the frequency of reptile or reptile morph traps? Sorry, I had a little bit of static. It was hard to, to hear. Sorry, York. Um. Hmm. Hmm. I, think, I think he's asking, do you see a change in the frequency of arthropleurid tracks, you know, this is in the Maritimes. Oh, and, oh, and do you see a change in the reptile? Uh, uh, are they? Is there any related change in the reptile reptiliomorph tracks? In again, is that is that right, Jorg? Did I capture that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, in, in terms of frequency, um, the the oldest arthropleura tracks. So these are these these giant diplocnides. They look like uh, you know somebody dragging a. I love the way that Sir William Dawson described these in, in the 1800s. They look like a a child's toy cart with cog wheels, as if being dragged across the sand. Uh, we see them at Joggins. Those are the oldest examples in the Maritimes Basin, and they're very common. Uh, you know, a lot of studies. I'm I'm currently working on these from from the type locality. The type specimen is missing. But we found the type horizon is where they come from. Uh, and there's usually you know, half a dozen to a dozen specimens on the beach at Joggins at any given time. We do not see very many through thinking through uh, basically until we see basically the early gut. Uh, I'm trying to think of the age of that, but what we call the Malagash, which, which would probably be Muscovian. Um, in the late Muscovian at a place called Smith Point. And a recent discovery by a protege of mine, high school boy, uh, has found an entire sandstone ledge covered in at least a dozen trackways. Now, they've been known from that, that unit, uh, it's called the Cape John Formation, for a long time, um, but uh, in the Malagash Formation, but since the 1980s. But you know, typically you have to have, they're forming on the top of these sandstone bodies, these sandstone ledges. Um, but in terms of frequency, they sort of disappear for a little bit and then come back. And that's probably a resolution of exposure, but uh, we don't see them in the Permian, at least not yet. So the, the youngest occurrences in the Gazellian. Uh, Thank you. Oh. And, and, and the morphology doesn't seem to change at all. Uh, we do have lots of small diplocnides attributed to myriapods, which extend all the way back to the Mississippian, of course, but the, uh, and the small ones continue up through. Uh, we found, Olivia and I found a high abundance in what's known as the Clifton Formation, which is thought to be uh, middle, middle Pennsylvanian, but no large ones yet. Uh, the reptiles and reptiliomorphs we, we see the Nautilus sort of at Joggins and the reptilian morphs go back. There's been some work by Falcon Lane that goes back into some slightly older rocks, but Marchetti uh, 
and our colleagues have, have recently reviewed the uh, reptiliomorph tracks. Most of those would have been called the oldest reptile are now considered hylopus. And Joggins now has notable sort of the oldest true reptile tracks. Thank you, Matt. Um, Ryan Martino, you had a question? Yeah, actually a couple. Um, first of all, um, your biochron divisions are based entirely uh, on the maritime basins. Uh, have you not uh, considered the tetrapod tracks that occur in other basins like the Appalachian Basin and the mid-continent areas? Uh, it, it's not actually based on the Maritimes. I was just using the Maritimes as one example. Um, most of those occurrences are, are elsewhere. So Dromopus is from, uh, um, from Kansas. Uh, the oldest occurrence is, is from Kansas. Uh, in the Mississippian, the oldest occurrences are in the Maritimes Basin. And for Nautilus Serta, the oldest example is, is in the Maritimes Basin, associated with skeletons. But if you look at the Union Chapel mine site in Alabama, uh, that's about the same time period as jogging. So we're, we're not just using the Maritimes Basin. At, you at all. The, have you used the tracks from the Appalachian Basin? Uh, Spencer, have you looked at those? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ron, um, those biochrons are intended to be, they're based on a review of the global footprint record. Okay. The paper, the paper we just published, I put it up in the Dropbox folder yesterday. Okay. Um, okay. The fact is what, what Matt was saying, the, the Maritimes Basin gives you the most complete stratigraphically superposed succession of Carboniferous tracks. Except for the Chasmobian. <laughs> well, it's, got, it's got its gaps. It's, no, look, 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 look. Not, not, nothing, nothing's perfect in the non-marine realm. You know that. <laughs> um, it has its gaps, but the point I've made is if you're trying to do a biostratigraphy, a biochronology, the places like the Maritimes are gold because they give you a long succession. But you're right, you have to bounce around and try to stitch in you know, other records. And the Appalachian Basin track record is not real extensive. You know, I've worked on Dunkard footprints, so I'm familiar with some of it uh, firsthand. But it, it fits in this, you know, if you look at, I mean, Nota Lacerda uh, was actually named from Missouri, so it's not quite Appalachian. You know, not everything comes from Nova Scotia here. But what's nice is, the Nova Scotian record um, reinforces what we think is going on when we try to patch together all the disparate global records. Mm -hmm. Right. One other uh, quick observation. I know this is not continental ichnophases, but I've noticed a big change in the uh, Appalachian Basin between the Moscovian and the Chasmovian marine ichnotaxa. Uh, there are a lot, there's a lot greater diversity in the Moscovian, and uh, when you get into the marine units in the Chasmovian, uh, I haven't counted up the changes, but uh, you might have maybe one third of the the, the ichno genera that, that you see uh, in the Moscovian. Now, there's a climate change, of course, and, and even the color of the shales that are in with these marine units changes from pretty much black organic rich shales to uh, you know red and green shales, and I've wondered maybe, you know, food, food sources or, or, or uh, types have changed, but has anybody else, uh, you know, seen these sort of changes in uh, or decrease in the Chasmobian of, of marine ichnotaxa? Just kind of curious. I, I personally have not seen any of the marine realm uh, because the only marine rocks that we have that are definitively marine, normal marine, are in the, the, uh, the Vizan uh, in Atlantic Canada. So I, I haven't looked at them. Um, uh, yeah, everything is continental here. Uh, yeah, I don't know the answer to that, having, again, not really looked at the marine trace record, but one answer might be, you know, are, aren't you going from what I would consider more normal marine set settings in the Moscovian into more, you might call them stressed or, or mm -hmm. limited marine settings in the Casimovian? And if that's the case, you know, it's, it's classic biology theory. You're going to get a lot of R strategists. You're going to get a low diversity, very abundant. You know, it's interesting. I've seen trace fossil assemblages in shallow marine settings where all you get is one ichnogenes. You just get, say, paleophycus, which is a shallow grazing trace. And, and I mean thousands. They just pack the rock. And the understanding of that is, again, it's a physically or somehow um, environmentally stressed setting where you just get some R strategists, one particular type of arthropod or clam or something comes in, it proliferates ad nauseum, 
and you get a very low ICMO diversity assemblage. So I would say the answer to what you're asking, Ron, is got to be in some of the work of Luis Batois and, and Gabriela Mangano. If you look up some of their papers, they probably talk about this. They, they certainly do, but they're still looking at the ICMO generic level. Um, so when I pulled their graphs out, uh, we, we redrafted them just for the purposes of this talk and, and sort of removed the marine because we're only looking at the continental for this point or for this talk, but uh, they certainly get into it at the ICMO generic level. I, I don't know if you see a spike or, or in the Kazimovian, but. I guess what, I, what I'm saying to you is probably you're seeing something that's very much a facies change driven, you know, because all the invertebrate ichnotaxa, the ichnofaces models, I think are based on the fact that they are so facies sensitive. Yeah. You know, some big crazy reptile can walk through all sorts of environments, but little shrimp don't do that, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Okay, well, <clears throat> we're pretty much out of time here. So uh, we'll move on to our next talk. Thank you very much again, Matt. Thanks.